Hello and welcome to our week four supplemental lecture on Thomas Kuhn's The Route to Normal Science. This is a chapter in a larger work uh, titled The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. The work is extremely influential and also very controversial, and we'll look at some of the reasons why it's controversial in our other topic this week when we're looking at postmodernist approaches to the sciences. This particular chapter, though, is focusing on something Kuhn calls normal science, which is science that has the characteristics that are being described by a lot of our other readings in this section, where it focuses mainly on highly specialized problem solving within a research framework. And Kuhn's going to be talking about the historical conditions for that kind of science to take place. He thinks it's something that emerges at different historical periods for different sciences, and he's going to run through some examples in this chapter. So he starts out defining his terms. He's interested in these related terms, normal science and paradigms. And a paradigm for him is a necessary condition for you to be able to carry out normal science. Okay, so the sort of science that people are describing in some of the other texts we've read this week, where they talk about scientists being very specialized and making only very small incremental additions to what is already known, he says that you can only get that kind of work when people have enough of a shared framework that they don't have to constantly be trying to refound their discipline. And so they have a, a body of shared knowledge, fit, shared theory, shared method that has enough consensus that they can work on these specialized problems. So in talking about a paradigm, he says a paradigm drives research firmly based on one or more past scientific achievements that some particular scientific community acknowledges for a time as supplying the foundation for its further practice. These for a time phrases indicates where he's going to go. He thinks that paradigms can be discarded or overturned or supplanted by new paradigms. And this is one of the things that's going to make him controversial, as it can sound to some critics who have relativist implications for science. And we'll talk about that more, particularly in relation to our other topic this week. When science is functioning within a paradigm, you have, if it's existed for long enough, maybe a textbook that sort of summarizes the common assumptions, or if the discipline is early enough, you might have one or more foundational works. And what these works do is they define the problems and methods of a research field that can then be carried forward by successive generations of scholars. Okay? To attract enough people into this kind of research program, a new paradigm needs to be novel enough Okay, so it needs to be powerful and original in some way that attracts people maybe away from other schools of thought or draws people into this kind of work for the first time. They're willing to put energy into this rather than into founding their own system or doing something else. But it also needs to be open-ended. It needs to not look like it's solved everything, so there's no more work to be done. It leaves tasks for succeeding generations of scholars to continue whittling away at. And he says, achievements that share these two characteristics I shall henceforth refer to as paradigms, a term that relates closely to normal science. So a paradigm has certain characteristics. It establishes a coherent tradition of scientific research where it's possible to sort of point to it and see that there's a group of people that while they might be working on different things are all sort of sharing a common tradition and a common purpose. You can socialize students into membership of a community that gathers around a paradigm. So everyone in that community is taught how to and then accepts similar rules and standards for scientific practice. The people in that community are not constantly arguing with one another about basics, about foundations, about first principles. And because they agree on these first principle issues, they don't have to be constantly trying to explain why they're working on the problems they're working on, why these are important problems. They can get to work actually moving forward. So you get development, you get progress, to use the language from some of our other readings. You get specialization because you get consensus around fundamentals. And then he says, you don't always have paradigms. And there are areas today, he suggests, that social science still doesn't have paradigms now. So everybody's still trying to always found the discipline from first principles. We don't have enough consensus. You only get paradigms in a mature science. Conclude what you will about the social sciences uh, from that argument. 
You can have research, though, and you can even find out interesting things when you don't have paradigms. And this is the case, he thinks, for most disciplines, for most of human history. Mathematics, he thinks, founded a paradigm very early, and so it was able to make some significant progress before the modern period. Uh, things like astrology, although we don't think of them as being sciences today, also could be argued to have a paradigm, and you can make sort of progress, kind of, within the framework of that paradigm. But before you have paradigms, you have competing schools of thought. There isn't consensus. You, so you have different schools emphasizing different kinds of observations who can't deal well with the range of empirical material that's possibly out there. He says, being able to take no common body of belief for granted, each writer on physical optics, which is his example in this section, felt forced to build his field anew from its foundations. In doing so, his choice of supporting observation and experiment was relatively free, for there was no standard set of methods or of phenomena that every optical writer felt forced to employ and explain. So you're always starting over from scratch. It's very difficult to make forward progress when that's the case. At the same time, you're sort of randomly choosing what you're going to look at and focus on. There's not a systematic attempt to account for particular bodies of observation. And he says, we still see this in creative fields today. You can still do significant and important things, but you get a massive forward motion. In optics, he says, after Newton, and in the natural sciences generally today, because the academic natural science disciplines do operate as normal science within a paradigm. There's high consensus over the basics, and so people can focus on the details, and you get genuine progress that way. He goes into a nice example about electrical research. He says, early in the 18th century, you've got multiple views of what electricity is. They're contradictory. Some of them can explain certain phenomena reasonably well, but can't deal with other phenomena at all. There's, he calls it a family resemblance among the theories, but there's no real consistency. And so everybody who's writing on the topic is writing a first principles kind of text. They summarize everything from the ground up, and it's quite difficult to make forward progress. He says, eventually, Franklin and followers who gather around Franklin develop a theory that can account for most effects. And it's significant for Kuhn that it doesn't have to account for everything. It can have anomal anomalous observations that suggest there may be problems of various sorts. One of the things a paradigm does is it decides which observations you need to worry about and which ones you don't. So Franklin and followers develop a theory that has reasonable coherence, that accounts for most things reasonably well, and it takes over the field. A paradigm emerges. And Kuhn says that this pattern is historically typical. But history suggests that the road to a firm consensus is extraordinarily arduous. Okay, so we've had a high level of these sorts of consensuses in the modern period, uh, and that may itself be interesting. And it's interesting to ask whether Kuhn explains that kind of historical periodization. But certainly, you can't take for granted that a paradigm is going to emerge, certainly not that it's going to emerge easily, and that then you're going to get this kind of consolidated research program based on it. So what does a paradigm do for you? He's already sort of addressed this earlier in the chapter. It simplifies the observations and experiments you need to do. And it does this by deciding on an order of priority for the phenomena that you need to account for. He says, in the absence of a paradigm, all of the facts that could possibly pertain to the development of a given science are likely to seem equally relevant. As a result, early fact gathering is far more nearly a random activity than one that subsequent scientific development makes familiar. And this is quite interesting. So in some ways, before you have a paradigm, you may be more open in certain ways to all kinds of evidence. You don't know what's important. You don't know what's not. but Progress actually relies a on a level of closure, on excluding certain observations as not worth analysis at that point. He says, without a reason for seeking some particular form of more recondite information, 
Early fact gathering is usually restricted to the wealth of data that lie ready at hand. So on the one hand, it's more open in the sense that people will consider all kinds of strange information that they might not bother to look at once a paradigm is in place. But on the other hand, because you're always having to start over from scratch, it's not actually worthwhile or may not occur to people to do more elaborate, more long-term, more resource-intensive kinds of data collection because you don't know if it's going to pay off. You don't have a reason to know where you should direct those energies. So what you get in pre-paradigmatic science are things that are sort of part of common knowledge and then information from various crafts where people might know more specialized things because there's been a technological reason to work in that area or an artistic reason to work in that area. And so we may know some more refined subject matter. And he talks about the kind of material that gets combined together in the works of people like Bacon, uh, who just sort of, you get a jumble of different kinds of data, of different kinds of importance, and that we can now say, well, some of that information would have been very important and useful for where people were then. Some of it is actually too complicated to even try to explain until lots of other discoveries have been made in other disciplines. Bacon doesn't have a way of knowing that, and so you just get this vast compendium of data jumble of disorderly observations, that Kuhn says don't speak with sufficient clarity to permit the emergence of a first paradigm. And then a paradigm wins out. Something emerges that is powerful enough, that helps people organize things, that directs investigations, and the divergences between various competing schools of thought at that point begin to disappear. Often it's one of the pre-paradigm schools, one of the ones that was fighting it out, that turns into the dominant paradigm, but sometimes you can get something that sort of emerges that wasn't part of the original dispute. And the one that is victorious isolates some aspect of a chaotic collection of information and focuses research on that aspect. It often is not able to account for all known information. And the fact that it's not will become something that can set up for the displacement, for scientific revolutions, for overturning existing paradigms and replacing them with new ones. But while the paradigm is dominant, it's okay not to be able to explain everything. It just needs to be powerful enough to tell a coherent story about a chunk of things in a way that directs research further along those lines. Kuhn says, to be accepted as a paradigm, a theory must seem better than its competitors, but it need not, and in fact never does, explain all the facts with which it can be confronted. The paradigm helps people prioritize. It tells them what is the line of investigation most worth pursuing. And this enables researchers to focus their energies on actually making progress in that line of investigation. They can afford to do more intricate research, more risky research along a particular area because there's a reason to think it might pay off. So you get more specialized equipment developed and you get a more specialized division of research labor and because of that you get progress. And then you've got these old theories and they're still sort of hanging around. Uh, the paradigms end up defining the field more rigidly than in the pre-paradigm period where you could have lots of competing theories and people could drift among these, and the scope of the field will inevitably be broader when that's the case. When the paradigm forms, the field narrows, it specializes, and it excludes a lot of people who would have previously regarded themselves as working in the area. Some of those people will be attracted to the new paradigm, and they'll just join in the new, more rigidly defined discipline. The paradigm may also sort of speciate off, it may form a new specialist discipline and opponents are left behind in some more general, more amorphous field. And he talks about the fact that sort of things that would have at one point been scientific endeavors, once you get the modern academic scientific disciplines, a lot of people who are not able or willing to move into those disciplines kind of get left behind in philosophy departments. Okay, is the modern instantiation of this. You can get the development of textbooks summarizing the state of the knowledge. You can get forms of socialization for new practitioners to train them up in the state of knowledge. They can specialize and increasingly address each other in specialized publications, in journals, in conferences, in departments. 
and he talks about this being marked in a shift to privileging journal publications over books. So a book is the size you need if you've got to refound the discipline from scratch. But if you can take all that for granted, if you don't need to say that every time you're writing, you shift to short, sharp communications with other researchers who know the context for your research, where you're just saying, okay, here's the next incremental thing that I've added. And you get rapid development of knowledge so that people who linger on from the older fields who are not making this kind of progress get left behind. They die out. Okay. So that's Kuhn. We'll take a look at him again uh, in the context of some of our other themes in the Science Week. But the thing to realize here is that he is someone who could plausibly be assigned in either of our topics this week. He's a pivot figure, and we'll play that out and discuss it in class.